This is a presentation of the 19th Annual Colorado Snow and Avalanche Workshop, a program of the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, Friends of CAIC, and the National Avalanche Center, presented by Dina Fit and Pomoka. Hello, my name is Stephen Harvey from the SLF in Davos. And I would like to present you a new methodology for high resolution automatic mapping on avalanche terrain. First of all, I would like to thank the co-authors who all did a very great piece of work. And our work was focusing on the recreational backcountry, considering typical ski triggered avalanches and also for large scales like the whole of Switzerland. Most of the work has been presented already at ISSW 2018, and recent work has been done now on validation. So when traveling in the backcountry uh, or when planning backcountry tours, terrain assessment is crucial. Uh, so when skiing such slopes like this skier here, several questions come up. For instance, could an avalanche release in this terrain? Or could I also trigger an avalanche remotely? And how far would an avalanche run out? And are there also some safe spots where nothing or hardly anything could happen? But we also have to think about the consequences if an avalanche would release. So the goal of our study was to create high resolution avalanche terrain maps on typical skiered, tri skiered triggered avalanches, which reach a maximum size class three. And we wanted to focus this on different terrain sections. And these are potential release areas. So areas between 30 and 50 degrees slope angle terrain below where avalanches can be triggered remotely and even further below the area where avalanches run out and of course safe spots where it's hardly possible that a size 3 avalanche can reach us. And we also looked at the potential of the consequences such as serious injury or deep burial. Finally, we wanted to know if the classification is in line with the map with mapped human triggered avalanches all over Switzerland. To calculate the potential release areas, we looked at the terrain features of 5,200 mapped release areas around Davos. We looked at avalanches of size one to three class. Because we uh, because only the outlines were mapped, we had to create an algorithm to capture a possible release area. And within this release area, we looked at three different terrain features. And these were slope angle, uh, a planar curvature, and a kind of a curvature in all directions, which summarizes a kind of a roughness of the terrain which we call the fold layer. And from these three terrain features, we calculated a three-dimensional kernel density estimate. And this measure principally shows how likely the combination of these three terrain features is to be in avalanche terrain air, in avalanche release areas. The graph on the right shows the distribution of this calculated density within the 5,200 release areas. With this density function, we now could calculate for any terrain pixel containing those three features, a specific density value. And you can see the result on this tiny map on the right. We only considered slopes between 30 and 50 degrees slope angle and everything above we defined to be as extreme terrain and did not consider that. But also terrain below steep slopes has have to be considered and associated with the possibility of remote triggering. And to get an idea where avalanches typically get triggered, 
remotely, we analyzed a data set of 75 remotely triggered, uh, human triggered avalanches. And we see that mainly or most avalanches get triggered quite close to the release areas. And the further away we get, the, the lower is the frequency and also the probability of releasing remotely. Of course, uh, you need a certain instabil instability in the snowpack that is, is even possible. So mostly it's between zero and 100 meters there, we have the most uh, remote triggered avalanches. So we use this data and uh, created or calculated the potential for remote triggering with a least cost path analysis. And this analysis calculates the, the path costs between two locations. Uh, for instance, like in the image on the left, between the red and the yellow squares. And the calculation was started from the release areas downwards and the start costs were transformed from the density values which we calculated before with the, from the release areas. And the costs were added up uh, by a cost raster we used. And the cost raster for accumulating the costs was based on one hand of this state set or of this curve, this Weibull curve from the 75 uh, human triggered avalanches. And secondly, from a assumption that if terrain gets rough or has more uh, profile curvature, especially more convex terrain, it's, it's more difficult for fractures to propagate than if terrain is smooth. And the calculation of the path was stopped at the threshold value of 70. And this resulted then in another layer, which we can see on the right. To calculate the runout distance, we used the RAM simulation model, RAMs extended. And previously, uh, we had to generate release areas automatically. And then from these release areas, the RAM simulations were calculated. We assumed a scenario for size class three avalanches with a fracture depth of 50 centimeters and dry snow conditions. And finally, we calculated 860 RAM simulations all over the Swiss Alps and the Jura. At the end, all these simulations were Com com uh, compared and validated with a data set of 869 mapped human triggered avalanches all over Switzerland. And we see that the density values within the release areas of both the avalanches and in Davos and in Switzerland are distributed the same. And this shows that the extrapolation to larger areas is feasible. The simulation for remote triggering was compared, compared with a small data set of 30 locations where avalanches were triggered below the slopes. The resulted values of these locations are in the range of the costs from the applied Weibull function. The avalanche perimeters of those avalanches overlap the ramp simulation mostly. And uh, the graph below shows that uh, the overlap is nearly by 100%, that most uh, avalanches overlap by 100%, and only about 2% of the perimeters did not overlap the simulation. Finally, the three, the, the layers of the three simulation methods I just explained were combined to a single classified avalanche terrain map, which is now open to the public. And it distinguishes between these release areas, the areas below the slopes where remote triggering is potential and the runout of maximum size class three avalanches. 
But when thinking in terms of risk, we also have to consider terrain traps and think about what are the consequences of an avalanche. So what would happen if I would get triggered, uh, if I would get caught? And therefore, we created another layer which characterizes the potential for deep burial and serious injury. The deep burial was calculated from results of the ramps output and the estimation of a serious injury from a fall was determined from velocities and accelerations along calculated trajectories in the fall line direction. The two results were then combined into a single layer of consequences. With these different layers, we are finally able to create different products, such as the classified avalanche terrain map, as we saw before, or a specific map mixing all these data together into a map with continuous values. Another product we will provide soon is an automatic crux detection in terms of avalanche terrain on our white risk tour planning platform. So if you draw a, a route and you can see after automatically where potential terrain cruxes might be, and you also can see what kind of problem, terrain problem you might have there. So the presented maps provide insight into typical avalanche terrain and focus on important issues such as avalanche release areas, potential for remote triggering and the run out as well as the potential of consequences. The conclusions are that the methodology we used is feasible for mapping avalanche terrain on large scales and concerning the, the runout zones, we saw that our simulations were rather conservative and we surely need further development and maybe also try to consider other scenarios. We also plan to improve uh, the simulations on considering the forest a bit more than we did up to now. Up to now, we just said, forests, if there is a forest, there is no avalanche problem. And uh, of course we could distinguish there a bit more. So if you are interested in these maps, you can see on these two web links, you can find information and, re and you can look at the, those maps, uh, how they look like at the moment. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready for the discussion and questions.